First thing first, I would like to thank everyone for joining to us for another Australian Fluid Mechanics seminar series, a lot of us. And before we start, I would like to thank David, on behalf of everyone, like me, uh, uh, thanking David and Sean for their great job and wish them best luck in their new positions. And uh, this is a great pleasure to meet uh, Professor Nicholas Lawson, who kindly accepted to give us a seminar on in-flight measurement. He is a uh, chair of, uh, in aerodynamics and airborne measurement and head of the National Flying Laboratory Center at Cranfield University. He is an expert in measurement of a very wide range of uh, fluid flows, high speed, large scale, non-Newtonian and multi-phase. And his current research is focusing on new techniques and tools for the measurement in airborne and aerodynamic measurement. And he also has a commercial pilot license. With this, I'm handing over to him. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for the um, introductions before. Uh, it's, it's great to see some, some of you over there and um, everyone else who's listening. Uh, I had a look through some of your, um, your, your seminar series and you've already had some fantastic talks from people all over, all over the world. Um, so it's a privilege to give the talk today. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions during the, um, during the talk if you want, um, and uh, at the end. Uh, so I'll, I'll get my slideshow going. Hopefully you can see, everyone can see that. Uh, okay, good. So, uh, um, I'm going to talk about the National Flying Lab generally and some research we do, but also um, I'm going to talk specifically about one, one piece of research I've done in the last 12 months. Uh, I also need to acknowledge a couple of colleagues who um, were involved in the research. Firstly, Anna Neves, who, who was an Erasmus student. Um, one of my colleagues, Simon Davis, he's a test pilot uh, and he helped me with some of this. And there's a uh, an old colleague and friend, um, Bidur Canal, who, who's a DES um, expert, he, he works at Coventry University. Um, so in terms of the contents of the uh, presentation, the, we'll, we'll look at the Cranfield facilities and uh, NFLC initially, and then um, we'll go into the main, main part of the research, which I, I did uh, on testing uh, Slingsby, which is that yellow aircraft just down there uh, in the stall, which can be, um, it, it's, it's quite a difficult environment to do testing in a stall. So I'll bring out some of those issues. And because uh, we, we have access now to um, some very advanced numerical methods um, compared to, for example, 20, 30 years ago, we'll be applying um, a DES method to the stalling aircraft as well. We'll look at that. Uh, we'll, we'll, have, um, we'll have a look at some um, different angles on that and then a summary and conclusions. And again, questions at any point if you want to. So Cranfield itself, it's, it's a um, slightly unusual institution. It's, it's exclusively postgraduate. The numbers of students aren't that high, um, 5,000 or so. Um, and it tends to focus very much on facilities and um, links with industry. So a lot of work is focused with big industrial partners and small partners. Um, and one of the reasons they come to Cranfield is some of our facilities. So there's NFLC, we've got about eight or nine wind tunnels. Uh, for a speed range. We've got our own airfield, which is a licensed airfield with instrument approaches. And there's um, structures labs, gas turbine labs. <coughs> um, there's a significant photonics group and they have labs and I, I work with them. Um, and also we have two supercomputers. Um, the other thing that recently has formed is there's, um, they, they bought a number of facilities um, to this together for this global research airport. Uh, one of those facilities is a digital control tower, which is actually on the site. And they installed that in the last two years. Um, and that's a partnership with Saab in Sweden. And Saab are um, 
developing the system and also promoting the system um, at Cranfield. So you can see a picture of it in the control room at the bottom there. In terms of NFLC, uh, we currently um, have three operating aircraft. Uh, the three on the left um, are flying at the moment. So at the top, we've got the, um, the main flying lab. And what we do is, is we bring um, a practical experience of flight test to uh, undergraduate and postgraduate students. And the inside of the aircraft is fitted out like a laboratory. So the students sit in the back. Uh, we give them a briefing, an academic briefing, and then we take them flying and they take data. And then they have to interpret the data into um, some angle on flight tests like uh, stability, aerodynamics, um, potentially um, some angle on dynamics of the aircraft. And so we can do a number of things and we actually do do the flying and they get the, the real feeling of the G's and, and the maneuvers as we, we fly them around. At the moment, we're flying about 1600 students a year um, from about 24 universities around the UK and we also fly the, the Cranfield students. Um, in, the, in the Slingsby aircraft here, uh, we, um, we take students on flying experience and flying, not flying lessons, but more give them um, an idea about how the aircraft handles, how it stalls, how it spins. And, and we, we, most of the engineering students will have one or two flights in, in this aircraft, um, the Slingsby. The one on the bottom, the Bulldog, is being fitted out as um, also as a research platform um, and it's a continual process which we're, we're doing with the aircraft, but it can also be used for the same flight experience as, as the Slingsby. So I'll talk about the Bulldog a bit more in a minute. The, the jet stream um, here was, was bought in about 16 years ago and uh, it's coming to retirement in the next 12 months. And, uh, Part of my, <laughs> my life has been um, involved greatly with replacing it in the last two years. So um, I've been leading the replacement, which is this aircraft here, which is a Saab 340. Um, it's sitting in Sweden at the moment and it's being fitted out as a laboratory. So by uh, the middle of next year, the Jetstream is retiring and the Saab is, is going to be starting flying the students instead. And we've also got some industrial partners um, interested in the Saab as well. The one at the bottom, whoops, the one at the bottom is another jet stream which only just retired in the last year. Um, and we, we did flight trials in that with BAE Systems. Uh, it was used as a, a surrogate um, aircraft where the, um, they had a sat link and you could actually fly, fly the aircraft with a second autopilot from a ground station. So you could test UAV, uh, UAV systems um, in flight um, and you could control the aircraft from the ground. But of course, the pilots in the front could take over. So the CAA in the UK were happy with that because there was always a fallback of the pilots. And, and this aircraft was um, involved in a number of major flight trials, um, which were, were, were named Australia. And but that that's that's been retired sadly in the in the last twelve months. So the new aircraft, which we're getting, um, we've bought it and it's being fitted as we speak. Uh, it's going to arrive in Cranfield at the end of the year, and it's fitted out as a lab, as with the jet stream. But it's um, also got Wi-Fi this time in the cabin, um, and we can have more interactive experiments. Uh, we're going to measure all of the. Um, major parameters that you would want for, for doing basic flight test. And the students will be able to see these on this, this kind of tablet arrangement. So every student, <coughs> excuse me, will have a tablet <coughs> and um, they'll be able to access parameters in flight so that we can give them a, a, a better experience than the jet stream. <coughs> We're gonna get additional data as well. We're, we're uh, up updating the inertial and uh, GPS systems. <clears throat> and we have um, Honeywell, um, a SATCOM system that we're, we're looking at getting fitted on the aircraft. And also Megit, the large company Megit, who makes avionics. 
they're, they're potentially looking at a, a flight trials rack um, to, to be confirmed. But we ideally, we want this aircraft to do, do a dual role of industrial work and, and the flying labs. The Bulldog, which I mentioned before, that's um, <clears throat> it's an aerobatic category aircraft like the Slingsby, uh, two seats side by side. We did initially modify it in a, a large EU program um, and we put fiber optic sensors. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we've recently um, modified the aircraft with an air data boom. You can see um, in the bottom, bottom right corner there. And the, and the aircraft now has a whole series of uh, parameters. It can, it can me uh, measure elevator positions, flat positions. Uh, it's got an air data computer, the data boom for angle of attack and angle of side slip. So it's, it's quite a capable small aircraft to do um, research work on. Um, this was one of the projects we did on it um, in, as part of the modifications, which was a European um, program called AIM-1 and AIM-2, uh, Advanced In-Flight Measurement is what AIM is. And uh, in AIM-2, AIM we, we fitted um, fiber optic strain sensors on the wing and also uh, pressure, this is the pressure sensor plate we fitted on the back here. Uh, we did um, a number of flight trials testing the pressure sensors and the FBG sensors. Um, I talked about this work at Sydney actually, Ben might remember two years ago, um, and um, I went over what we did in detail there. Um, the, 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 the big thing that uh, <clears throat> helps me in, in all of these applications is, is collaborations. I, I collaborate with um, quite a number of different people, and I always have done. Um, uh, one guy I want to mention is, is Ralph Tatum. He's head of uh, engineering photonics labs. Uh, so we work quite closely on this project to put the sensors um, on the aircraft, design the sensors and, and fly the sensors. Um, other projects I've also been doing with Ralph was um, a recent one, um, which was an Aerospace Technology Institute um, project with Airbus helicopters, where we put fiber optic sensors on a helicopter. And it didn't fly, it was tethered, but we, we, um, we put the fiber optic sensors on the blades. You can see them mounting um, the sensors on the blades. And the, and the helicopter was um, tethered and, and the engine ran. Um, and they had a Wi-Fi link, the top here, you can see the top box is a Wi-Fi system, an interrogator, and then it, it would stream the data onto, into, a, uh, into a, a van that was sitting about 50 meters away. So we could monitor blade shape and, and um, also blade strain, uh, potentially in flight, but we didn't fly in this instance for a number of reasons, um, but it could have potential to fly. Another more recent project we did through the ATI, again, the Aerospace Technology Institute was, um, um, it's still ongoing, this project called Windy, uh, which is about developing sensors for uh, wind tunnels and for um, um, advanced design at Airbus, Airbus UK. And we've put some fiber optic sensors on this um, transonic wind tunnel model at the ARA in Bedford, which is the aircraft research establishment. Um, and we've, we've tested the sensors up to Mach 0.82. The sensors have worked reasonably well. Uh, there are still some issues with the sensors and the, the, the sensitivities on the sensors, but we matched um, a reasonable response on the pressure sensors here. You can see the spectra for the um, fiber optic sensor and the Kulik sensor. So the, the fiber optic sensors in this case were benchmarking quite well when comparing them to conventional Kulite sensors. Um, fiber optic sensors, they offer you um, a number of advantages that you don't need the electrical connections. Um, they're as sensitive as conventional sensors. And you can also route them uh, over long distances around bodies and objects um, without, without any, any issues. The main issue with them, we, we, we always finding is, is how to temperature correct the sensors because they're sensitive to temperature and usually another measure and. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of background for you um, on um, NFLC and some of the work that we do uh, out of NFLC with the aircraft and without. <clears throat> so I'll now go on to um, the, 
uh, main part of the presentation, which is uh, for the uh, stalling Slingsby. Okay, um, so the background here. Um, this is a very unfortunate accident which happened um, uh, over 10 years ago now, um, and you may remember it. It was a uh, Air France uh, Airbus 330, <clears throat> and it was coming back from Brazil, and uh, it, it, it disappeared. It, it went into the sea. Um, they, they eventually found the data recorders, and um, there was a lot of incredible work done, and they worked out what the problem was. Well, in the report, the accident report that was released by the French Accident Investigation, uh, BEA, there were a number of key factors that were identified. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the key factors was the aircraft stalled. Um, now, people who um, <clears throat> have a bit of knowledge about Airbus, they, they know they're fly-by-wire aircraft. There was a whole series of circumstances with this accident, but ultimately the aircraft stalled and um, the crew didn't recover it. Um, the first, the first um, the first knowledge of a stall that I, I found in the literature was 1907 or 1908, I think, which was Cody flying one of his aircraft. So it's not a new problem, um, and it continues to cause um, aviation certain challenges in various situations. For, for, for example, this is another report on a small aircraft, the Air France aircraft is obviously a large aircraft. This is a small aircraft, it's um, not that long ago, five or six years ago. Uh, good weather conditions um, and the witnesses say the aircraft was seen to descend rapidly, spinning and spiraling. Uh, so this aircraft entered a spin um, and the, the pilot didn't recover. So it continues to, to be a, a problem in aviation and a fixed wing aircraft will spin and stall. And you have a stall before you spin, but pretty much any category of aircraft potentially can, can stall and then spin. <clears throat> so if you're, if you're trained to deal with the stall or the spin as a pilot, you recover the aircraft um, and it's not, it's not an issue. But generally you only spin aircraft or, or stall them if they're in the right if they're in the right category and you know if they, if they stall and then they spin that you can recover from the spin so an aerobatic category aircraft <coughs> is specifically um, tested to be stalled and spinned but um, other categories of aircraft um, which stall and then spin may not have been tested so you're not entirely sure with those aircraft that you could recover and you can see here the accident rate continues to be an issue for general aviation. This is from AOPA. And uh, ironically, a lot of the accidents which happen happen quite close to the ground with a stall and a spin in the takeoff or the climb. Um, and still, if you look at the statistics, um, the stall and the spin is killing about 30% um, of the pilots in, in general aviation. <clears throat> now, obviously, you can do design, aircraft design, and improve this. <clears throat> but a lot of the um, aircraft design still involves testing and you only test an aircraft in a particular category depending on how you're going to certify it. So um, if, if, uh, if I can just <clears throat> review <clears throat> what a stall is, a stall is, is a condition where you have significant boundary layer separation of the, of the main lifting surfaces, in this case it will be the wing, um, generally stall would be uh, a loss of lift from a, a wing or a body uh, with the separation. In terms of an aircraft, the key variable here for the stall and the spin is, uh, is the angle of attack. And the angle of attack um, is, is defined by the flight path angle here and the reference line on the aircraft. Um, so typically in a wind tunnel, you have a level condition because you set the models up um, based on an effective horizon in your wind tunnel. So it's relatively easy to measure um, alpha, angle of attack alpha. In an aircraft, obviously the aircraft can, um, when it's flying, it can take um, flight paths vertically, horizon horizontally, depending if you're, whatever you're doing. Um, you can be descending or climbing and that will define your alpha. 
and 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 therefore um, measuring um, alpha in flight is is more complex than, for example, measuring in a wind tunnel. When you stall an aircraft, um, you reach a point where you stall with increasing alpha, and then the lift available will fall, the drag will go up significantly, um, and you reach a, um, a, a stall angle, alpha stall. You have a significant increase in drag and unsteady flow off the aerofoil once you get the stall. So that the stall will lead into a spin. Um, the best way to describe a spin is to actually look at a movie of a spin. So I'll do that now. This is um, a movie of a, a NASA test in the late 1970s on a, a, a light aircraft. So just look at the movie and see what the aircraft does and then we'll discuss it um, in a minute. Okay, so you can see there, it's a very dynamic maneuver. Um, it's almost taking up a, a vertical descent path. From a po cockpit point of view, this is a, a spin in a Slingsby. So this aircraft is certified to spin and it has, it has done, um, at the certification stage, many, many tests to it. So you can reliably spin it and recover, but this is a cockpit view and it just gives you an idea, the kind of confusion if you didn't know what was going on that the pilots might think was, was happening. Okay, so um, if you're trained to, to deal with the, the spin, you, you know what to do to recover, which is you have to use a, um, the rudder and the elevator. <coughs> but essentially, the, uh, the interesting thing here is the spin is actually, eventually will become a stable flight condition. Um, the wings have asymmetric stall and the aircraft auto rotates um, it, it, about an almost vertical axis. Um, it actually takes, the flight path actually takes a, a, a helical path and the aircraft's pitching, um, it's rolling and it's yawing simultaneously. Um, the recover, you have to stop the yaw, so you use the rudder and then you use the elevator to pitch the aircraft forward to, to um, reduce alpha. <clears throat> Alphas in a spin, depending on the spin mode, the alpha in the spin can go as high as 60, 70 degrees. Um, the spin you just saw um, in these two aircraft, uh, the alpha is about 40 to 50 degrees. Uh, typical stall, the alpha going into a stall on a small aircraft is anything between 50 and, uh, 15 and 20 degrees. But in a spin, you can get much uh, significantly higher alpha. So <clears throat> the actual development of the spin, um, you could see in the video, you started off straight and level. The pilot then pitched the aircraft um, up to increase alpha. Once the aircraft stalled, it started descending. And then it goes into a stage called the incipient spin, where the flight path goes from um, a horizontal or slightly descending flight path into a curved flight path. And then eventually when it establishes in the spin, um, the flight path is almost vertical and the Throughout this, this um, development into the spin, um, the, the change in forces and the balance of forces and moments changes. So in a in stable flight, um, lift equals weight and drag equals thrust. Eventually in a spin, lift is balanced by centrifugal force and, and actual weight is balanced by drag. So there's a reversal. Also throughout the development from um, straight level flight into a spin, there's significant changes in the stability of the aircraft and the moments acting on the aircraft. And these are related to the way that the aircraft stalls. So 
there's a lot of um, very interesting fluid mechanics behind stall and spin, but it's quite hard to predict um, exactly what the aircraft is going to do before you, before you actually build it. Um, and you can see here on the left, the, the pitching moment and aerodynamic coefficients are quite complex the way they behave. And some of it depends on the interaction with the tailplane, but essentially a lot of this behavior is driven by the stall. Um, because this is, is complex, generally it's validated through flight test and wind tunnels. And that's, that's always been the way it's done. But what you find sometimes is that the aircraft is built and it's, it's flight tested and there is a problem with the spin and they have to do a fix on the aircraft because they couldn't predict it at the point of design. Um, and that's still going on um, as we speak. Spin itself, there is theory for the spin and uh, um, the best theory I found for the spin is from a guy called um, Phillips in um, this book here. You can have a look at this um, off, offline if you like. Um, the spin is based on a stable um, spin characteristic um, that I haven't as yet found any theory that um, can predict the transition from level flight to the spin. So this is a, a, a large area that's, that's open to further um, investigation, particularly now that we have these very advanced numerical methods um, and we could potentially apply this at the aircraft design stage to start to predict the stall and the spin um, and, and ultimately improve the safety and, and ultimately save fixing stuff at, 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 the at the point of certification. So this is the kind of angle and the motivation that I'm coming from. Now, 30 years ago, you didn't have these sort of numerical methods uh, to look at these sort of problems and predict some of this behavior here. But I believe now we can start to get to the point where we can, we can look at this. <clears throat> so the actual um, the test itself uh, and, and the flying, we, we did a number of different stages in the test in the aircraft. Um, we started uh, straight and level, and then uh, we measured the stall using a, a number of different techniques and did some visualization. Uh, we also found from the work with the aircraft that, uh, that the, there was an interaction from the wake with the tailplane, which gave us a, a, another piece of work we did towards the end of this project. The numerical work, um, we, try, we, the, we tried to um, develop that sequentially by starting um, in similar to the flight with a, um, a steady strain level solution, and then we adapted it into a, an unsteady model, um, which I'll outline in a minute. <clears throat> so I'll talk about all of these stages and then we can, uh, we, we can summarize at the end. So we started with straight level flight to get in the aircraft to get data on lift coefficient and angle of attack. Um, we then applied that to a steady CFD solution. We then went into stalled flight to look at CL max, the maximum lift coefficient at the stall. And we also looked at Buffett. Um, because we were going to use that as a, um, a way of, of, of validating some of the unsteady aspects of the CFC, CFD solution, the unsteady CFD solution, which we developed um, eventually as the last part of the project. And then we compared both. If we look, if we look at the, <coughs> the aircraft, uh, it's an aerobatic aircraft, as you've seen just from the video. Uh, side by side, it's got a 260 horsepower um, engine. <clears throat> These aircraft were used by the RAF for about 20 years to train their pilots on ab initio training. It's got a good G envelope, um, it weighs about a ton, <clears throat> and the Reynolds number you get is about 4 million uh, 50 meters per second. Um, the maximum level speed is about 70. Um, you can do about or 90 in a, in a, in a controlled dive. Um, so you can get a reasonably good range of, of Reynolds number from the aircraft. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first part of the flight test we did was straight and level. And <coughs> we need this to, to, um, to 
initiate the CFD solution and to check that we're getting reasonable um, levels of CL for, for alpha and, and drag as well, we can check that. The simple technique <coughs> um, is we fly the aircraft level with power. Um, we can get alpha from the pitch attitude. We simply measure the pitch attitude of the aircraft in flight. And then we can equate the mass of the aircraft to um, the lift and the thrust of the engine. We take a component of the thrust and we equate the component thrust to, to drag. <clears throat> and we can do that over a series of speeds. Uh, <clears throat> we record the airspeed, the altitude, and then um, we get power from the engine uh, instruments inside the cockpit. And we, we can equate um, drag to thrust because we make some assumptions about the propeller um, and then we calculate a thrust because we know that the um, thrust times the airspeed, the true airspeed is gonna equal the engine power. So we're simply converting power to effectively uh, um, the product of airspeed and, and um, thrust. <clears throat> and we equate thrust to drag. So <clears throat> we, we completed these flight tests um, over a series of speeds. And I'll show you the results in a minute, but I'll just talk about the, C, the CFD model setup. Uh, we, had a, uh, we, we needed to use a, a single mesh for both the steady and unsteady model. We, we felt that was the best way forward because we were going to initiate the unsteady solution with a, a steady solution. Uh, we chose the Kaomega SST model for the um, turbulence model, and we, we set the grid spacing based on um, uh, recommendations from um, Spellart and um, blending as also recommended um, by the DS technique. The course, the mesh, the mesh um, sizes we went for were coarse, medium, and fine, and we defined the um, region for the wake through a, a wake density region with a cell size it was 30 millimeter cell size um, eventually when we went to run the unsteady solution the, the time step was uh, 0.67 milliseconds um, and i think we were using 10 iterations per time step it's 10 to 20 i'll, I'll have to check on that but as, essentially <clears throat> we validated um, our initial steady model with the same mesh. Uh, the Y plus we set for the, the mesh was one to five for the SST model, <clears throat> with a focus on the wing because um, the, wing, the wing wake was the key component that we were interested in here for looking both at the frequency of the shedding and also the interaction with the tailplane. We also set up a, a number of monitoring points um, above the wing, behind the wing, and near the tailplane. Um, and we also monitored lift and drag during the, the simulation, both the steady and unsteady. <coughs> the actual uh, results we, we got, we, we, we ended up compromising with our mesh, and we, we used a medium mesh, um, which had 11 million cells. And typically, it was taking about um, 60 hours of CPU time on our HPC to, to get one, one angle of attack. Um, and we looked at a different range of angles of attacks uh, for, um, uh, for the, the mesh refinement. If we look at uh, those two cases here with the, the um, steady model, we can see the uh, evolution um, or the dependence, sorry, of the mesh on the features in the um, surface flow visualization. Um, the, the, at the 18, 18 degrees, there's a cellular structure forming, which I'll talk a bit more about later, but we eventually uh, decided to go for the medium mesh um, as a compromise for giving us uh, suitable um, resolution on, in terms of flow features and computational time. When we compare the CFD, the steady CFD, um, to the steady CFD to the um, flight tests, within, within the confidence intervals, we're getting a reasonable prediction with the RAND's simple uh, steady model. 
Um, the reason that the aircraft isn't stalling here, where the CFD is stalling, is because uh, we have power and the, sli uh, the propeller slipstream um, keeps the, um, the flow attached for longer, so it stalls later. But in the actual stall flight, we have to take the power off. Um, when we looked at the um, um, stall development on the CFD, you can see here that you have the trailing edge separation moving forward, and then you get the cellular structure, um, and then you go post stall. But we're predicting uh, around a stall at about 16 degrees with the CFD. For the, for the actual flight now in the stall, because the first flight we did was straight and level, this time we need to monitor the flight path angle and the pitch attitude, and we sum both of those to get our alpha. So during stall flight, we take the power off and the aircraft will start descending. So we have to monitor um, flight path angle constantly throughout the stall, and eventually the aircraft gets unstable and starts pitching, and you have to recover the aircraft before it spins. So you do have a time limit in which you've got to monitor um, flight path angle and pitch attitude. Um, the other thing with this is when you get into stall, the airspeed indication is a pressure instrument in the cockpit. The airspeed indication becomes unreliable. And, and so we, what we elected to do was to use GPS ground speed, but fly crosswind. Um, if you fly into wind or with wind, you don't get a reliable um, estimate of your airspeed. So you fly crosswind with the GPS. Um, it, you do runs, um, reciprocal headings, and then get data that way to estimate your, um, your airspeed from GPS. Uh, so we did two, two setups for monitoring alpha in the stall. One used a simple digital level, and we met and we monitored cockpit instruments and then had a GPS on an iPad. Um, and the other one was um, using a Pixhawk unit, one of these drone autopilots, where we could monitor simultaneously pitch. Um, we could monitor GPS at five hertz, um, and then uh, we could we could do it. So we could do this at a higher data rate. The First method here, we are only limited to about hertz. We could only measure GPS at a hertz, um, and this needed some interpretation on the digital level for pitch attitude. With a Pixhawk, which was only a few hundred dollars, although you difficult sometimes working out exactly what the, the errors were, but we did the estimates on that. <clears throat> we could get GPS at five hertz for our, our airspeed and pitch attitude at 250 hertz. And then we can use a GPS altimeter as well on both units, the first and the second setup, to estimate the flight path angle. The flight path angle will come from your forward airspeed and your vertical airspeed, which you get from the alt altimeter. Um, I have put the errors in the presentation, but the main error here that I want to highlight is flying crosswind. If you, if you don't fly crosswind, uh, the GPS error for your um, your, your airspeed becomes very significant and then it affects the flight path angle. So you need to fly um, crosswind um, for your measurements and you get the, you have to estimate that from the meteorological forecast. So you need to know which heading to fly, but you get the MET data uh, from the MET office and you work out which tracks to fly. Some of the other errors um, have to be estimated um, because the resolution of the instrument isn't what you end up trying to observe as you're measuring it. Um, and there, some of them we just have to do an uncertainty analysis on stable data to see what the sort of errors are. But we could get alpha between two and four degrees with these methods. We had to resample the Pixhawk data because GPS data was five hertz and Pixhawk was, was in some, gave you 250 hertz. So there was some resampling. But the alpha results we got you can see here um, where we're predicting flight path um, angles in, in up from the stall. This is the with the simple method one, and this is with method two with the Pixhawk. And you can see we're getting um, alphas of around about 10, uh, sorry, 15 to 30 degrees with a stall, um, a stall happening around about 
20, uh, 10 to 14 to 18 degrees, we kind of thought we applied any estimate of here of our stall angle to the unsteady CFD results. Um, we also did some um, work on um, the buffet to, to look at the buffet of the aircraft in the stall, comparing it to the unsteady CFD. We did an additional test with um, inertial sensors with a higher sample rate than the Pixhawk, and we placed three inertial sensors in the cockpit. We checked the natural frequency of the wing as well by a ground test, and then we ran um, a further flight test with these higher spec inertial units to look at the buffet frequencies. Um, we also put tufts on the wing at the same time with this test to see how the stall developed on the wing. And then we could compare the development of a separation on the wing to the, the CFD. So this is um, a stall sequence in this test for the buffet. <coughs> so you can see um, the stall warner comes in and then the aircraft starts to buffet and then at the end the wing drops suddenly. You can see just at the end of the sequence the wing drop. Um, the tufts on the wing um, you can see the stall develop and then the wing, the wing drops. So you can see the trailing, trailing edge separation starts. And then the aircraft starts to buff it and then the wing drops and then the recovery is made by the pilot. So with that sequence, we could look at the um, development of the stall on the wing with the tufts. Um, it's slightly qualitative, a mix of qualitative and quantitative, but it gives us an idea with the dimensions of the, of the cells developing, how the stall's developing as we increase alpha. We estimate alphas um, from our measurements during the stall sequence. And we're picking up the main gross features quite well on the CFD, which was encouraging. Um, the, the mushroom cell is again for, for discussion, but that was predicted by uh, wines and cats and we were seeing evidence of that potentially in our flow visualization. In the Buffett tests, um, finally, um, this final flight test, we took a sequence after the stall warner, you could hear the stall warner beeping there, and we took this sequence and then broke it up into different windows to estimate the Buffett frequency at different alpha uh, before the G break where the wing drops, you could see where the wing dropped. This is a typical output from the IMU, the inertial unit, those, um, those higher spec inertial units. And then you look at the spectra, um, and this, uh, this was estimated at 14 degrees from our um, sequence of alpha during, during the stall. You could see we're getting a um, dominant frequency of buffet. Uh, we're estimating about 11, 11 hertz at this particular alpha but it is also changing with alpha. Um, if you look at the CFD data, uh, this is now the DES result. We were looking at spectra um, with a similar pattern in the spectra with a dominant frequency. This is now slightly different alpha, um, but we're, we're getting a similar kind of pattern um, in terms of dominant frequency from the flight test. When we start to plot the flight test and the CFD, Together, we can see here's the flight test with increasing alpha by taking those windows. And then we compare it to the CFD DES model. And you can actually see that there's a, um, a very similar behavior of um, decreasing frequency with alpha. Uh, so we're getting a pretty good match in our dominant frequencies between our flight test and our DES. And we're obviously very happy with that. Um, in some cases, it does depend how you can um, window your alpha, but the, the results match very well within a percent in terms of a dominant frequency between the CFD and the flight test with the DES model. So if we look at the actual DES model, you can see the stall, um, the main uh, vortex lines forming here and becoming wavy um, and then breaking up but interacting significantly with the tailplane. And um, we, we didn't expect, we, we weren't sure what to expect about the tailplane interaction, but it's a, uh, it's a von Karman type shedding mechanism 
but also you have wavy patterns developing here on the vortex line as predicted by the CATS paper. Uh, so because of the, the match with um, frequency and, and features we're getting, we were reasonably confident that the, the CFD was giving us, the DES was giving us a really good result. Um, you can see here how much the wing is stalled and the tail plane at the back here is um, not stalled very much at all, which is good. You want that kind of characteristic for stability in the aircraft. Um, but significant interaction with the wake and, and the tail plane which led to the last part of the presentation. I'm wary of the time. In the last part, because we saw this interaction um, of the, of the um, wake with the tail plane, we went and did an additional flight to look at, the, um, to look at this behavior because um, wake interaction with the tail plane could affect your stability of your aircraft. It comes back to my original point of applying this data to, to design. So we, we, we looked at the natural frequency of the tailplane before we flew it, and we found that there was a dominant frequency on, on the tailplane. We put an accelerometer on the tailplane of around about nine hertz. Um, and if you, know, if you remember the CFD frequency range, it was between eight and 11 hertz. So the shedding frequency from the wing is, is actually very similar to the natural frequency of the tailplane. So we went and flew again and took a rear camera view and if you look at this movie and you start to look at the tail, the interaction with the tail plane is reasonably obvious. So the plane's stalled now, and now you can start to see it's actually um, interacting with the tail plane. And then the wing drops and the pilot recovers. So we took, we took these movies and we took a window from the movie. Um, I've got some PIV software that I've had for many years, but I, I adapted my PIV software to, to do correlation, spatial correlation on this window. And then you take a, um, a specific vector from the, the window and look at the time series and then do a spectra. And if you do the spectra, on that you find that you actually get um, the the wake at some points the wake is actually hitting the natural frequency of the tail plane which is why we're getting that significant movement on the tail plane so not a particularly good thing to have in a design clearly the aircraft flies it's checked it's certified but that's something you might want to change if you could design the aircraft again um, so just to finally summarize I'm wary of the time here I've presented to you um, a, a series of flight tests which we use to validate models using surface flow visualization, buffet, um, and other straight level flights, flight, uh, flight tests. We um, use some simple equipment to try and get alpha because alpha, getting alpha in, in a stalled aeroplane is quite challenging. It's a very dy dynamic maneuver and the aircraft can, can spin as you go into the stall more heavily. So we used some simple equipment to get alpha and flight path. We, it, it was good to within a few degrees, which allowed us to, to get a, a good idea about our CFD uh, setup. The CFD model, um, we're very pleased with that. It, it did predict the Buffett behavior really well, and it also showed us an interaction with the tail plane, um, and we did a further flight test and found that that interaction actually was near the natural frequency of the tailplane. Um, uh, we're extending the work now. Um, we want to extend the DES to, to possibly some kind of um, control of the wake, but there's all sorts of angles here this opens up that you, you wouldn't have had before as an aircraft designer. Um, so hopefully that's been an interesting 45 minutes for you. I'm happy to take questions. I'm sorry to whistle through that. Uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you for the great talk. So I opening the floor for questions, if there is any, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, I've got a question. That's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so you might have mentioned this and I might have missed it, but in terms of the unsteady simulations, 
Um, were they, that what you're talking about a transient simulation there, or are you talking about actually having some sort of um, temporally bearing body force that you use to kind of simulate the, the store? Um, with the, the, the CFD, the DES, we, we simply set an alpha and ran the unsteady simulation. So there was no um, change, there was no change in the alpha during the simulation. Oh, gotcha. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, no, my fault. So just that, that point, Dave, that um, the ideal way to do this, and it's a very fair point you brought up, yeah, the, you can see how dynamic the real stall is and, and actually the, the, um, there's hysteresis and other um, behavior are coupled with the way the aircraft stalls. So in, a, in an ideal world, you would have a, um, a dynamic mesh as well and that would get your results even more um, re realistic. But we're still pretty happy with how close the results seem to match. Could you have a static mesh and just have a um, body force, like a gravity vector that basically changed in time? Potentially you could. Um, I mean, the, the stall behavior actually does depend on the pitch rate that you enter the stall. So oh, okay. that, 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 um, the pitch rate generates the G on the, on the airframe. So I think there's a whole series of angles here that you could probably improve this basic, you know, fixed alpha. Thing that we've done. Oh, gotcha. Thanks. I might have a question too. Sure. When when you're doing the experiment in the lab, everything is under control. You have mm -hmm. the, some sort of control environment, humidity, temperature, and everything. But when you're doing these uh, measurement in flight, how do you count those? variations because you don't have control on weather is it rainy is it what's the temperature and yeah. also how do you impose this condition into your cfd model yeah it's a it's it's a very good question um the the simple answer to that is you um you try and do as many repeats as you can uh, we uh, on the alpha the alpha tests that um i showed you we um we did um, a, a number of repeats and we, we looked at we looked at the range of alpha we were getting um, you you ideally so you, you do you do repeats that's one thing you try and do um, when you're doing flight tests the other thing you try and do is you try and fly in the best weather possible um, you can correct some of your data for um, international standard atmosphere ISA and that's a, a typical thing that you do so you correct your density altitude and other variables so that that you've got equivalent conditions, um, and, but you also try and choose the best day you can to fly. Um, we, we possibly didn't fly in the best weather we, we, we could have done, but then sometimes that's limited by the time you have and the resources you have. I mean, if, if you're doing flight tests in, in, the, in, in you know, Airbus's world or Boeing's world, then you, you need very specific conditions before you go and and do the flights and then get the data for certification. So um, the environment that I was just showing you there was, was constrained a bit by our budgets, our, our aircraft availability. People like Boeing and, and Airbus wouldn't do that. They would pick very specific conditions to fly in to get repeatability. If, that, if that's answering. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Vasily Stofil is here. Oh, the, yeah. the, the question would be, uh, in your experience, when you see the, let's say, let's fix uh, just the focus on CFD and yeah. one specific alpha, and then you see the stall cell appearing. Can you describe this process as abrupt or gradual? in mathematical terms, non-linear slash linear. And then, of course, the acid test is the flight test itself. Does this observation in the CFT correspond to the way the mechanism, the stall cell appears? Um, I, I, I think the, if you looked at the movie of the, of the flow visualization on the stall, the, the stall tends to develop from the trailing edge and moves forward. Um, 
and and I, I if you could fix if you could fix the alpha in flight you you'd expect um the the cell that forms from a trailing edge sorry from a trailing edge and moves forwards you'd expect that to become um reasonably consistent um the Reynolds numbers are quite high on the te on 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 the test throughout any alpha. So the problem you've probably got, the biggest problem you've probably got, is is the is the hysteresis effect. It's it's the the speed at which you enter the stall to get a consistent result. Um, so although you're going to get consistent flow patterns forming from a trailing edge, I think some of those to some degree will depend on um, on the entry into the stall. Uh, so if you if you fix alpha for your CFD, there is going to be some difference um, in the in the um, way that the cells behave because in some ways it depends on in in real life it depends on how you develop those cells initially when you entered the stall. So they're never going to be exact unless you can model the um, the entry of the stall exactly and you do a dynamic mesh, for example. Um, that's the only way I think you're going to match it exactly. Um, but given we didn't do that and we just fixed an alpha, it is still remarkable how consistent some of the behavior of the stool numbers and the um, frequencies we're getting are. So there's going to be some inconsistencies and this is the problem between doing flight tests and running the CFD. But it still seems to give you a remarkably good result. I'm not completely answering your question, but you have got a, you've got a, you've picked up on a difficult point there. Sure, uh, thank you. Just a follow uh, a quick follow up question: uh, Have you ever seen multiple cells on that specific wing? Uh, what cells? Say say again. Multiple, multiple cells, more than one. Oh, oh yes. So, um, okay. Yeah. The. The, the, the evidence um, from the flow vis that we got, the surface flow vis on the wing during the stall, is we were seeing two cells on the wing. Um, if you look at um, cat, cat's paper, um, vinyl cat's paper, then they came up with a, a simple um, relationship between the number of cells and the aspect ratio of the wing. And for our aspect ratio of that semi, semi span, it's about um, six. He was predicting two cells and we were getting two cells. Um, as you increase the aspect ratio, um, so if you had an aspect ratio um, double, double that, you'd expect to see four cells, for example. So if you, if you had a glider wing, um, you would see more, you would see probably even higher than four, maybe eight cells, depending on the aspect ratio. So there is, there is a very um, empirical relationship between cells and aspect ratio. Um, and in a way, this is an opportunity, perhaps with these unsteady methods, that this could be, be validated and, and now tested, potentially. Okay, thank you. Nearly finished, James. I think yeah. if there is no more questions, we might finish this seminar and thanks again for giving us this seminar thanks and thanks very much Sharon. thanks it's, to everyone it, for joining us yeah. it's been it's been great and um sorry it's been a bit of a whistle stop but any questions please feel free to contact me and i can also send a pdf out as well if you want with all of the links if people want to see the, the movies again perfect thanks okay thanks again even share it on on our website thanks yeah. And right. everyone, feels, no worries. And everyone, feel free to invite other people to this seminar for next week. I guess next week we're going to have Matthew Emmes from University of Adelaide. And have a lovely weekend and enjoy your time in isolation. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.